Thank you for tuning in to Manifesting Sons broadcast. Today we would like to share with you an impactful message by Dr. Mark C. Jones Sr. Black Holes, Disrupting Destructive Life Patterns. We hope you enjoy our program. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read two verses and then jump into today's discussion. It says in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Verse 15 is the critical verse. So, but what about you, he asked, who, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. Today, as we conclude our series, Black Holes, I want to share with you for a little while from the subject, Drowning in a Sea of Opinions. Drowning in a Sea of Opinions. I thank God that Jonathan left off. He started talking about opinions, and I, I said, Lord, now move him away. I said, Lord, snatch him, because he about to step into my message, and won't God do it? God, so he's mentioned opinion, then God snatched him away from my message. <laughs> but there are a lot of believers in the body of Christ right now that are not able to exhibit and to convey and to express and to be the light that God wants them to be because they're too concerned about too many opinions that don't matter in their life. There are so many believers that are stuck in a rut that are hindered and hampered because they care more about what men think of their persons than who God says they are. And, and they care more about the opinions of men than they do the purpose of God concerning their life. They are drowning in a sea of opinions. One of the reasons we've been teaching this series on black holes is because we have endeavored to arm the believers against the distractions of this age. Look at somebody and tell them, you're being armed against the distractions of this age. Last night I taught at the Issachar Conference in Orlando, my dear friend, Apostle Anya Hall, and one of the things that I began to convey there as I've conveyed here is that the new economy is the attention economy. I talked about it before I left here that the name of the game today had nothing to do with money. Uh, per se, but it's more about who holds your attention. Some of us right now don't realize that major corporation and the powers that be are buying and selling your attention to the highest bidders because they understand that whoever holds your attention governs your life. Write that down. Whoever holds my attention governs my life. That's why the Bible says, perfect peace have they whose minds are, watch this, whose minds are stayed. Somebody shall stay. So notice the connotation of that scripture is that God, say God wants to hold my attention. Listen, he wants to have and to hold my attention. That's why he says here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. That's why he said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. He not only wants to have my attention, say he wants to hold my attention. And that's why distractions in the form of opinions can be so deadly. Because there are some of us right now that are chasing the wind. You're trying to run down rumors. You cannot outrun a rumor. You can only outlive it. You cannot outrun a rumor. Tell somebody you can only outlive it. Uh, live better than what they're saying is all you have to be focused upon, but you cannot outrun a rule. Listen to this. Through this series, we've been working to encourage the believer, write this down, to cultivate awareness of God and an audience with God. How much more powerful do you think your life would be if you were every day aware of the presence of God in your life? How much more, watch this now, how much more focused would you be in life if you were only concerned about the audience that you have with God. Jonathan said in first service that the antidote is that we need to host heaven. And I agree with that. I concur. 
that one of the things that we, we need to really be focused, somebody shout, I'm only concerned about my audience with God. I need to tell two people, you ain't worth my audience with God. This is why I forgive you before you ask for forgiveness. This is why the Bible said love does, love overlooks what? Love overlooks faults. Love overlooks offenses. Y'all realize that there is security, there is safety in the principle. So when God said that love overlooks an offense, what God is saying is, listen, I want to keep you in a power position. So now what, no matter what happens or no matter who it happens through, come on somebody, I want you to overlook it before they apologize. Somebody shout, the principle is saving me from a season of despair. Now watch this now. And that's why God tells you to overlook an offense. Tell somebody, don't repeat it. He that repeated the matter separates close friends. I don't want to damage people who want to damage me. Oh, hello, somebody. Listen to what the Bible said. The Bible said, he that repeated the matter. Tell your neighbor, stop repeating it. It doesn't matter who said it. It doesn't matter what they meant. The Bible told you, stop repeating it. Because he that repeated the matter separates close friends. Tells me, I don't want to damage you with my influence. Now watch this now. I don't want to damage people who would gladly damage me. Ask me why. Because I live in the audience of God. Tell somebody, you can't take that offense in the audience of God. Are you hearing me? You know, I can always tell people who don't have, who don't recognize or don't cultivate or really don't, aren't really conscious or cognizant of the audience of God because they're quick to hold stuff and repeat offenses. And that's how I know people really haven't cultivated the kind of audience through fellowship with the Spirit that they should cultivate. Because, and when I say to you, I don't want to harm people who would gladly harm me, you know why I'm telling you that? Because I stand in the audience of God. Now, what about my safety? What about my security? What I've come to understand is that the Lord reserves the righteous for himself. Did y'all read the book? The Lord, look at somebody shout, the Lord reserves the righteous for himself. The Bible said the Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. Tell somebody, don't bother a seeker. You don't bother a seeker. Because when you, when you, when you, when you disturb, who? When you disturb a seeker from seeking him, heaven puts a hit on you. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. Some of the stuff where people are calling the devil is God said, no, there are some people you just don't touch. Come on, there's some people you just don't touch. Watch what God said. God said, now, now listen, there's about five people on this road you can be bothered with, but he said, the righteous I reserve for myself. And when you got the kind of repertoire, when you have the kind of rapport with God, well, God said, no, I have reserved you because, hey, because I found you to be a worshiper in season and out of season. Look at somebody tell them, don't touch this. And you know what gets me is they, the same ones always got their mouth on somebody and always speaking evil, right? I don't know why all this going on in my life. I don't know why I can't get a break, right? All, I don't know why, right? Look at somebody tell me, I know why. I, I know exactly why. Here's why, because you don't know who to put your mouth on, who not to put your mouth on. You don't know who to touch and who not to touch. Say it with me. I stand in the autumn of a mighty king. Say it again. Ooh, say, I stand in the audience of a mighty king. Now, for me, Pam, ain't nobody worth it. They're not worth it. They're not worth it. And there are so many right now, you're drowning in a sea of opinions. You can't, the reason you haven't been actualized in your calling is because your attention is fractured between the will of God, watch this now, the will of God and the rumors of man. And, and what you don't understand is the only power that other people's opinions have to affect your life is the power that you give it when you give your attention to that foolery. Tell somebody, focus. Tell somebody, I'm going to need you to focus. Listen, tell somebody, I'm going to need you to focus. Tell somebody, you have a presence, you have an, you have an audience with God, and I'm going to need you to focus on who is... 
who he is in your life is bigger than whatever's being said about you. Y'all got that, believers? You're drowning in a sea of opinions. One of the reasons that God inspired this series is because we have been given a mandate to establish the 21st century believer uh, who is alert. Say, I need to be alert. God wants you to be more alert. You need to understand what's going on around you. You need to discern the times. We need sons of Issachar back. We need people that understand exactly what's going on. Tell somebody you can't be terrorized when you know exactly what's going on. You can't be distracted by the news when you know exactly what's going on. You ain't in fear of no doggone pandemic when you know exactly what's going on. You need to be alert. Now, not only do we need to be alert, God is raising up believers who are adaptive. Say, I need to be adaptive. In other words, I need to be able to adjust and become whatever God needs in the situation. I need to be able to adjust and conform to what God needs me to conform to in order to, look at somebody tell them, I'm going to slip in there before, I know what I, before they know what I am. They're like, oh my God, we ain't know we let one of you Christians in the group. That's right, that's right, man. You didn't know, but I'm here now. Somebody shout, I need to be adaptive. And we need to be on assignment. We need to understand that this is just an assignment. This is just an assignment. And as such, it requires your focus. Y'all got that? Now let's go back to our text because Jesus and, and even Paul are great pictures of extreme focus when dealing with a whole lot of opinions. Verse 13, when he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now I want you to notice that people were conflicted about who Jesus was. Tell somebody, and you too. But I want you to notice that even though they were conflicted about who he was, he was never conflicted about himself. Now, it doesn't matter how Conflicted people are about who you are and what your motives are. Tell somebody, don't you get conflicted. Tell somebody, your job is to be clear about you and clear about God. Y'all didn't know what I said. You need to be clear about you and... Y'all didn't hear what I said. You need to be clear about you and you need to be clear about God. And this is the reason that getting caught up in the opinions of people can be so deadly to your calling is because it moves you away from the clarity and intentionality that you need when walking out your assignment. So all the people's conflicts and ideologies about who about, about you should have no bearing on how you see yourself. Y'all got that, believers? So this is once again, what Jesus says here is once again a revelation that his orientation was in the Father. And watch it now. And he was grounded and settled because his orientation was the Father. Watch what he said. Watch what he said. I only come to do the will of him that sent me. Come on, somebody. I am come to do the will of him that sent me. Look at somebody telling them, what are your motives? Your motives have to be clear. Your motives don't have to be explained. They have to be clear. I must be about my father's business. You understand that? My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. I must work while it's day because night. All of that, listen, all of that is reflective of a soul that's in order. Tell somebody, get your soul in order. A soul, listen, in order, in order to cultivate audience with God, you have to have a soul that's in order. I, I, watch what Jesus said. I only want to do the will of him that sent me. Only, exclusively. I only want to do the will of him who sent me. I don't do anything except I've seen in my father. Tells him I'm not trying to keep up with the culture. Hello, I'm not trying to keep up with the culture, but I only want to do what it is my father has given to me to do in this life. Look at verse 14. Watch these conflicted answers. Some people say you John the Baptist. Wrong. Look at somebody and tell them, I am not a do-over of your favorite Christian. <laughs> Look at somebody and tell them, don't be doing Juanita. It don't fit on you. <laughs> That's right. Some say John the Baptist. 
Others say you Elijah. Somebody shout wrong. Other people say you look like other people. Wrong. Other people say you like Jeremiah or another prophet. Somebody shout wrong. Now watch this. this. So watch what Jesus said. Some people said this. Some people said that. All of them were wrong. All of them were wrong. Which means consensus does not always mean accuracy. I mean, listen, tell your neighbor, quit checking Facebook to see who you are. Come on, look at somebody and tell them, quit looking at your likes to try to figure out who you are. Come on, tell somebody, quit checking, quit, quit checking your timeline. You are a conflicted soul if you got time to figure out if subliminal messages are about you. You, you are a conflicted soul. They don't deserve it. It ain't worth it. Say it with me again. I stand in the audience of a great king. Did y'all read the book? Everything in heaven is responding to the glory of the Lamb. Everything. When one person starts singing about one of his attributes, then everybody start breaking out in a song. Ain't nobody got their own thing going on. I want you to notice that ain't nobody checking their text messages in heaven. Everybody, because glory demands a resp Oh, yeah. <laughs> glory demands not only your attention, but glory demands a response. And I can't think of anyone who is worth the distraction. I can't think of anyone who is worth this place. Is anybody else in the room in this place with God? Look at somebody asking him, if you understood this place I'm, I'm with God, then you would, I'm, I'm, listen, then you would understand why I have to be so focused about what I'm, what I'm doing. Yep. Hallelujah. This place with God is not to be compromised by the opinions of men. You understand that? This place with God is not to be compromised by people questioning your motives. Y'all realize that everybody God used greatly, people question their motives? Come on, ask somebody, why are you giving that your time and your attention? Stay focused. El elbow your neighbor, say, stay focused. Because you stand in the audience of a mighty king. Huh. Y'all got that, believers? Now watch this now. He says in verse 15, but what about you? He asks, who do you say that I am? Now I want you to pay attention to this because this tells us how and what, when it comes to people, we should give our time to. Watch what he says. Who do you say that I am? So I want you to notice that he only cared about the input of people who matter to his purpose. Look at somebody tell him, you don't need everybody's input about your life. But you know what he said? He said to his disciples, he said to the committed ones, he said to the called ones, he said to the assigned ones, he said to the ones that were going to have to continue to walk out the assignment, who do you say I am? Tell somebody, never take input from people who don't matter to your assignment. What y'all think about the scriptures? Stop asking them people that. Stop asking them people that. Because you just walk away from that conversation confused. You understand that, believers? So he only cared about the input of people who mattered to his purpose. Y'all got that, believers? These are people who were, listen to this, they were sincere in their approach to him. Come on, somebody. Look at, look at your neighbor and say, don't let people play with you. Come on, tell somebody, don't let people play with your calling. I don't believe there are any more apostles. Then get out of my face. Why are you sitting up in my church if you don't believe in a, I'm going to be one whether you want to, hello? I may not be an apostle unto some, but those who know that I have an apostolic assignment in their life know exactly who I am. If you don't believe in my calling, get out of my face. Look at somebody tell me, I ain't going to stop being me. I'm not going to stop doing what I was called to do. I'm not going to stop shaking the nations. I'm not going to stop building the city. I'm not going to stop raising them up and sending them out. Tell, tell somebody, stop, stop letting people play with you. 
Now, now, when you stop letting people play with you, you know what they do? They say, oh, he's so unapproachable. Right. Leave it. Let's leave it right there. Let's leave it right there. You understand? He's so unapproachable. Right? Right. 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 Tell somebody, I am unapproachable to people who want to play with my calling. Yes, I am. Yeah, you can call me stuck up. You can call me standoffish. I'm just not, I'm not the one to be toyed with. Look at two people and tell them, I ain't got to be your prophet. I am still God's prophet. Y'all hear what I said? Listen, you may not like it, but you can't shut this anointing down. If I don't bear the fruit, then call me a liar. But if I bear the fruit, then recognize that surely the hand of the Lord is on that woman. Look at two people and tell them, I'm God's appointed and I'm God's anointed. It's time for you to quit needing the validation of man in order to walk out your assignment. Y'all didn't hear what I said. It's time for you to stop feeding on the rejection. Look at somebody tell them there's more rejection in the room than there is acceptance. It's time for you to stop honing in on the rejection. Why are you always honing in on the rejection? A lot of times there's more rejection in the room than there is acceptance. Y'all got that, believers? But how many know when you're accepted in the beloved, when you know you're accepted in the beloved, then nobody's rejection of you matters. Y'all understand that? Look, somebody tell me, you may not like it, but you can't stop it. Come on, tell somebody, you may not like it, but you can't stop it. So then watch this now. So notice that Jesus only cared about the input of people who mattered to his purpose. Tell somebody, you do likewise. I want you to notice that Jesus only entertained people that were serious in their approach to him. Y'all got that, believers? I want you to notice that Jesus only connected the people in whom there was an extenuating assignment. You know what he said? I'm going to invest in you because I got to leave here and what I've been called to do has to keep on happening. So I'm going I'm to pour the spirit of my father in you so you can do the works that I've done. Matter of fact, greater works will you. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I said. I'm going to impart into your life because you are a continuation of my assignment. Y'all understand that? Look at somebody tell them, stop messing with people that ain't a part of your assignment. Y'all hear what I'm telling you? You realize that you either got people in your life that are on, listen, they're either on assignment or they're part of your assignment. So you got to be quick to discern who is there for the right reasons and who is there for a whole lot of foolishness and distraction that has nothing to do with the will of God. Look at somebody tell them, I am getting too old for the foolishness. I don't know about you. Maybe it was after I turned 50, but I've gotten too old for the foolishness. Y'all got that? He says in verse 16, why does Simon Peter say? Simon Peter answered in verse 16, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Y'all got that? So Peter, watch this now. Peter was the first because he identified Christ or did identifying Christ make him the first? See, what, what matters is that you can recognize God and what he's doing in your life. Y'all understand that? In a sea of opinion, your mainstay is that you have seen God. In a sea of opinions, what matters is that what you're doing, you heard from God. In a sea of opinions, what matters is that you have a, anybody in the room got a revelation from God about you? Y'all hear what I said? See, the reason that so many of you are so thirsty for compliments, and, uh-oh, is it over here? The reason that some of you are so thirsty for the validation of men, here's why, is because you've never spent enough time with God in order to get a, hey, in order to get a revelation from God about you. Somebody say, I know who I am, and I know who I belong to, and I know where I stand, and I know how my life glorifies him. Now, now let me help you out. Let me help you out. If they can motivate you, they can demotivate you. Tell somebody, they shouldn't be your motivation. If they can encourage you, they can discourage you. 
so they shouldn't be your source of encouragement. Y'all understand that? If they can validate you, they can invalidate you. So they should not be your source of validation. Y'all understand that? Have y'all lived long enough for God to see how quickly people will switch out on you? Is it just me? Is it just me? Ain't nobody? Just me? Is it just me? Have y'all, y'all haven't lived long enough in the kingdom of God? Listen, 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 listen. When you have, when you have been undaddy as much as I have, Tell somebody, you better get over people's praise. Come on, tell somebody, you better get over people's praise. Tell somebody, you better get over people's praise. The same one that said, Hosanna. Come on, TJ. The same one that said, Hosanna. The same one singing your praises and liking your posts will be cursing you tomorrow. You better have an audience with God. You better know who you are in him. You better make sure God is the source of your encouragement. The Bible said David encouraged himself in the Lord. That right, says Barbara. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Say it with me. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Tells me you shouldn't need me for encouragement. You should need me to get yourself up. You should need me to break yourself out of the stupid that's going on. You should need me to break that black cloud that's over your life. You should need me to lift you up. You should you should, now listen. It's good if somebody come along and do it, but tell somebody I am unnecessary to your. The Bible said David encouraged himself. He said, "Look at you, God. Look at." Look at you still standing there when my men have turned on me. Look at you still standing there when they done stole all my stuff. Look at you still standing there when the devil think he done got the upper hand in my life. Look at you still standing there looking at me when everybody else has turned their back. David said, look at you looking at me. Somebody shout, God, I see you seeing me. God, I see you seeing me. How? Oh. He said, God, I see you seeing me. I see you seeing me. I see you seeing me. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now watch this now. And he walked out of that place stronger. Here's, here's the words, battle ready. Anybody battle ready in the house? I said, is anybody battle ready in the house? Is there anybody said, I have must recover all. I don't care if they got three days ahead of me. I must recover all. I don't care if it was a setup. I must recover all. I don't care what the circumstances are. Somebody said, I'm battle ready from the presence of the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm battle ready from the audience of God. Tell somebody you never come out of God's presence a coward. Come on, tell somebody you never come out of God's presence a coward. You ain't been with God if you still scared of man. You ain't, you ain't been with God if you still afraid of their faces. You ain't been with God if you're still checking their status every day to see if they're talking about you. You ain't been with God because an audience with, say it with me, an audience with God has made me battle ready. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm battle ready. Somebody shout, bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. Anybody got a no weapon formed against me shall prosper? Just somewhere down in here. No, 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 maybe you over here. Is there anybody in the room that said, I got something boiling up on the inside that tell me it doesn't matter which way it come from. It may come one way, but it's going to flee seven different ways. Somebody shout, it won't work. It won't work. No weapon form. It won't, hey, it won't work. You know, 
don't come out of God's presence still scared. <laughs> Y'all understand that? Tell somebody you need audience with God. You need to stand in the presence of a great king. Understand that? And some of y'all are running around. Well, tell me what you heard. Look, somebody tell me I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Well, what did you hear about it? What did you hear about it? Doesn't really matter. Quit drowning in a sea of opinions. Verse 17. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon. That's where the blessing is. The blessing is in recognizing who you are in him. Who he is and who you are in him. Y'all got that? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my, my father had to have shown you this. Now watch this now. So the blessing is in knowing who he is. Somebody shout, I know who he is in my life. Secondly, the blessing is sticking to this definition of him. Sticking to this definition of him. See, never change God's in a crisis. Never change God's in a crisis. Well, why, why the Lord letting all this happen? Don't, don't tell somebody, don't you bail on God now. See, if you misinterpret God, who going to help you out of this? <laughs> the blessing is in sticking to God's definition of himself. Write this down. Then the blessing is in living out. Tell somebody you got to live out that definition. You got to live out. You got to know who he is. You got to stick to the definition he has given you of himself. You got to live out that definition. You understand that? You know, there's a whole lot that God wants you to assume about life. Everything God wants you to assume, to assume is predicated upon something found in the character of God. Please hear what I just told you. It's a master key to living in the audience of God. There's a whole lot God wants you to assume about life, okay? To count it as if it's just true. Now, those things that God wants you to assume about life are founded in his character. <sighs> There's a whole lot you don't need to pray about. <sighs> if you already know him, if you already know his word, you understand that? Especially in uncertain times, especially in crisis, especially when there are so many confusing voices in the church, in the church, so many people mischaracterizing God. You know, one of the reasons that we and I have landed on the right side of everything going on, because I never changed my mind about who he was going through any of this. Tell somebody, God ain't did this, sin did this. And it's going to get worse because sin is getting worse. Look at somebody, the cup is being filled. Y'all didn't realize that in the realm of the spirit, there are measures, there are cups that are being filled. And when those cups are filled, then the wrath is poured out from the cups that are being filled. God didn't do it, sin does it. Don't get God twisted in a crisis. God will keep the one. God will keep the one who keeps the right revelation about him. Are y'all hearing me? God will keep the one who keeps. Y'all hear me? God will sustain the one who is unmoved about who he is no matter what you go through. Look at somebody tell them all you got to do is survive the contradiction. Come on, ask somebody, tell somebody, all you got to do is survive. There are times when God will allow things that don't look like God. Tell somebody, it's still God. He's right on the other side. It's still God. It's still God. Don't, don't, don't move away from who he said he is. Don't move away from who he said he is, no matter what you see. 
no matter what you go through. Don't move away from who he said he is. Y'all understand that, believers? That's your mainstay. That's your mainstay. That's your anchor. You understand that? I have people constantly, right? And they say it now to my face. You make everything look so easy. Y'all hear me? You make everything look so easy. I am locked into something that don't change. Huh. I'm locked. I believe God no matter what's going on around me. I choose God over government. I said I choose God over government. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Tell somebody you got to stay locked into him. Anchored in him. Rooted, rooted and grounded in him. You understand that? And your life, and your life will be sustained in a very, whoo, your life will be sustained in this very solid and established place. But you got to remain rooted and grounded in him. Don't be moved by all the things. The Bible says everything that can be shaken will be. Now, 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 now I need you to ask your neighbor, can you be shaken? Because see, the Bible said everything that can be. Is there anything in your emotions that can be shaken? Is there anything in your narrative about God that can be shaken? Here, here's one. Here's one. Is there anything you own that you love so much that you wouldn't be willing to lose it in standing for him? Oh, that's the one. That's the one. Because everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Y'all understand that, believers? Verse 18 says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. So God will build upon that which has been revealed to you. God will not build upon that which has been said about you. God will build upon that which has been revealed to you. Write this down. Don't allow that which has been said about you to distract you in the building process. Y'all got that, believers? Now, I want to write, I want to give you some scriptures to show you that this pattern of misunderstanding prophetic people didn't start with you. Because some of y'all swear all this foolery is original to your life. Look at somebody tell them, ain't nothing special about the mess you're dealing with. <laughs> ain't nothing, it's just you. It ain't new. It's just you. So there is this pattern of misunderstanding prophetic people that I want to show you in the word of God. But there's also patterns of resiliency that you need to remain connected to. Look at Luke chapter 2 verse 48 for just a moment if you would. Luke 2 Luke 48. Hallelujah. And in verse 48, when they saw him, Jesus, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why have you done this to us? Behold, your father and I have sought you sorrowing. And he said, how is it that you, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Now, why am I pointing that out as the first verse you need to consider in this pattern of prophetic people being misunderstood? Not even his mother and his caretaker, Joseph, understood. Not even they fully understood the magnitude of who he was and what he was called to do. Now, why is this important? Because there's some of you right now, that is the sticking point for you. Not even my own family believe in me. Tell your neighbor, so what? You still got a calling. You still have an assignment. You still have a God to glorify. You're still going to answer for the influence God has given you in your generation. His mother and his caretaker father 
didn't even understood. The, they didn't understand the magnitude of his calling. So what? Here's the second thing. Look over at John chapter 7 for just a moment. Somebody shout, this ain't new. It's just you. I want you to look at John chapter 7. Look at verse 3. Speaking of Jesus once again, his brethren therefore said unto him, these are the brothers that had the same mother. They said unto him, depart hence and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you do. Watch this. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For neither did his brothers believe in him. Neither did his brothers, my own brother, my own sister. Neither did his brothers believe in him. Look at Jesus, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Nobody can hate you, but me they hate, because I testify of it, and the works thereof are evil. Now here's the point. Not only did Jesus' biological brothers through Mary not believe in him, they completely misinterpreted his assignment. Listen to this. They thought he wanted to become famous. That wasn't, somebody shout, that's not my mission. Now, you know why this is important? Because when God really starts using you, there are people that will hate you for no other reason than the influence you have. And they will come at you, and they will target you, and they will dissect everything you say. You don't like me, but you're watching my dog on broadcast. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that you're not even clever enough to think your own thoughts? You don't have a thought until I say something? Now it's supposed. <laughs> but now the reason... The reason that Jesus' brothers said that what they said about him is because they misinterpreted, they misinterpreted his efforts and his assignment. They thought, oh, you're trying to become famous. So that's not my assignment. It's not what I'm here to do. I'm not, that's not what I'm here to do. You understand that? Look at somebody tell them, I'm not here to get anybody to like me. I am come to do the will of him who sent me. I am going to use my influence to the best I can to point to my father. I am going to use everything I can in my life to punch holes in darkness. I am going to, I'm going to spend the balance of my natural life snatching souls out of hell and bringing them into the kingdom of light. I'm going to make sure that if you're going to be depressed, it won't be on my watch. Look at somebody tell me, I'm going to say something to you today that's going to lift your spirit. I'm going to show you what it means to walk before God excellently. I ain't trying to become famous. I ain't trying to become anything. I'm just living what I am. Now, that's a critical key. Write this down. I need to just live what I am. Huh. I don't need to try to become anything. You understand that? My stock don't come up when famous people come in the room. And my stock don't go down when they depart. You understand that? My stock don't come up when rich people walk in the room. And my stock don't go down when they depart. You understand that? You know, I, I receive emails saying, we want to nominate you to be among the who's who. I'm like, delete, no thanks. I'm not trying to become among the who's who. I know who I am. And I don't need an award to tell me who I am. Y'all got that? He lived in the audience of one. Look at John chapter 8, verse 59. Who am I talking to in this house today? Look at John chapter 8, verse 59. Y'all going to get out so early, y'all going to cash out me dinner money. It says, then they took up stones, verse 59, John 8, 59, 
Actually, let's go up a little bit. Verse 57. Then Jesus said unto them, then, then said the Jews unto him, you aren't even 50 years old. And you talking about you've seen Abraham. Isn't this something? Isn't this something? I'm just telling you who I am and you mad. Somebody tell them, all I did was post it me. And you mad? You mad? I ain't mad. Oh, verily, verily, I say unto you, all the thugs knew exactly what I was talking about. Verily, verily, I say unto you. <laughs> Everybody that listened to trap music know what I was talking about. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Now watch what they did because they could not receive that. He just, all he did was told them who he was. I am. All he did was accurately conveyed who he was. I am. Now watch how, watch how they responded to him being authentically who he was. Who am I talking to in this room? Watch how they responded to him being authentically who he was. Tell somebody, it's time for you to stop dimming your light to try to fit in with people that don't want to receive you for who you are. It's time for you to stop dimming your light. Tell somebody, don't you dummy down your gifts. Come on, tell somebody, don't you dumb it down your, don't you water down your testimony, don't you dim your life, because listen to me, they gonna hate you if you do well, they gonna hate you if you do nothing. Tell somebody, quit dumbing down your gift, because you don't want to seem like a know-it-all. But you either know or you don't. You know, this is a true story. I had people, because when I got saved, I would read the Bible like we do now, over and over again, cover to cover. So when people, you know, when there was a topic, I got some value to add to this. And here was the comments. Man, don't you hate people that know everything about the word? And then, and then the next day, you, you, you asking me where to find something in the scripture. I'm like, how in the Hades you going to hate me for my knowledge of the scripture, then use me when you want to argue with somebody about it? John chapter 10, verse 9. <laughs> they used to call, exactly what they call me. They used to call me King James. Yes, they did. King James, right? So you hate that I know the scriptures, but then you calling me, asking me where a scripture is. So now watch this now. So they got mad because he had the audacity to be authentic. Wow. Wow. They got upset because he had the audacity. Look, you know what they said? Don't you dare be you. Wow. When just being you makes people uncomfortable. Because you make everything look easy. The way of the transgressor is hard. I'm locked into his yoke. He's making it easy. This is a life lived in his presence. Oh, come on. This is a life hearing him. You understand that, believers? Tell somebody he's causing this. Look at somebody tell them, this is the God effect in my life. Come on, tell two people, this is just the God. Hey, tell some people, this is just the God effect. This is the God effect in my life. This is what it looks like to walk with God and have God make it clear that he's walking with you. It's the God effect. It's the God effect. You make everything look easy. So they mad because you got the audacity to be you. You're going to call yourself a prophet and they didn't ordain you. You're going to talk about you speaking a prophetic word and they didn't ordain you. <laughs> Don't get mad. 
Just watch to see if what I said come to pass. Because a prophet is not known by the certificate that's hanging on their wall. A prophet is known by whether what they uttered has come to pass. Look at somebody tell them, don't get mad at me. Check my record. All right. Let's, let's, let's finish this. Let's finish this. All right. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 10. In a minute, I'm finna find everybody in the room to let you look at somebody tell them, this ain't new, it's just you. Come on, tell somebody, this foolery ain't new. It's just your turn to be dealing with it. Now, watch this, y'all, because some of y'all, watch this now. Verse 10, 2 Corinthians 10, 10, look what they said about Paul, our hero of the scripture, this apostolic wonder. Watch what they said about him. These church folk talking about him too, by the way. You ain't been talked about until you get talked about by church folk. <laughs> Hello, somebody. You ain't been talked about. Why? Because church folk have the latitude of your testimony to try to use against you. All right, now watch this now. Look at verse 10, what they said about Paul. Now remember, they are church people. They say his letters, watch this now. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. I don't know why y'all up in Paul's face. He's weak and unimpressive. <laughs> How many demons you cast out? How many shipwrecks you survived? How many times have you been stoned to death? How many times has Jesus revealed himself to you? How many angels have shown up talking to you? They said he was weak and unimpressive. They said he's contemptible. You know what they said? And he's ugly. Tell somebody, you ain't been called ugly to church folk call you ugly. You know why it hurt so much? Because y'all believe there's a difference between saved flesh and sinful flesh, and flesh is flesh, no matter who's in it. Think about what they said. He weak and ugly. The same man God used to write almost two-thirds of the New Testament. The same man that laid hands on the sick and they recover. The same man that cast out devils. The same man that stood in the face of kings and declared that Jesus is Lord. The same man that was willing to be punished and brutalized and wouldn't move from his testimony. Y'all understand that? And you won't even tell people you're a Christian on your job, but you'll criticize Christians. <laughs> you avoid a little, you avoid office politics. And he didn't avoid stoning and beating with rods. He didn't avoid, he was bold in his testimony. And the only boldness you have is behind your computer screen. Anybody else wish God to give you just a day to punch every Christian that talk junk in the face? That talk, they talk junk behind their computer screen and we, hey, what's up, man of God? Hmm. Man of God now, you better thank God I'm a man of God. You better thank God. You better thank God. You better thank God my, my, my conversion is real. I'm almost done. <laughs> Look at 2 Corinthians 11. Look at somebody tell me, it ain't, this ain't new, it's just you. Come on, tell somebody, it's just your turn. This is, this, is, this is the pattern of misunderstanding prophetic people. You ain't special. <laughs> I got, you know why I'm going through this? Because some of y'all swear, y'all swear it's, it's just, it's they, they targeting. No, they're not. No, they're not. Can I tell you something? It ain't even about you. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So Saul is finding Christians, 
dragging them to court, consenting of their death, looking for letters to go persecute Christians. Jesus showed up, knocked him off his beast, says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now hold up a minute. Saul had never seen Jesus. You know what he said? But when you came against sister so-and-so, when you came against brother so-and-so, them words that you said about Cornelius, that slick stuff came out of your mouth about Glenn. When you, when you, came, at, when you came at Audrey, you did it to me. Just my, it's not even about you. It's about the Christ that's being targeted on the inside of you. You ain't that special. Oh, but there's something in you that is. It's about something in you that is. Something in you is being targeted. So hopefully they can use something that shouldn't be in you to get you to respond before what's in you should respond. All right, y'all will get that one later. Y'all get that one later. Y'all will get it. Tell somebody they're trying to provoke you. I need you to tell two people you are being set up. Tell somebody they are trying to provoke you to prove that your salvation is not real. They're trying to prove that you are not truly called to what you say you're called to. They're trying to prove their point that all y'all Christians are the same. Tell somebody don't let people provoke you out of the character of Christ. Tell somebody you ain't going to prove your point with me. Y'all got that? You ain't gonna prove your point with me. Y'all got that? Your thesis finna fall apart on this one. Now, I don't have time to go to the rest of these scripture, but I'm gonna give them to you. 2 Corinthians 11, 7 through 15. Come on, it's gonna be 1.30. I'm telling you, man, somebody finna buy me dinner. Now watch this now. 2 Corinthians 11, 7 through 15. See, notice, in, and I want you to really pay attention to this scripture because in this particular passage, it was being rumored in the, in the Corinthian church that Paul was just money hungry. People planted seed to get people to not support Paul's efforts. People planted seed to try to twist the mind of people so they couldn't receive from Paul when he was ministering. So you know what Paul said? Paul said, all right, I got your tea tag. Watch what Paul said. Paul said, if y'all think that my mission about money, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to what I know how to do. I'm going to make tents, and when I preach to you, I don't want your love offering because your love fake. Paul said, Corinthians, I don't want your phony love offering. He said, keep your offering. I still got an assignment in your life. Keep your little honor gift. I still got an anointing for your destiny. Keep your love offering because you don't understand what love is anyway. He said, so I'm going to just go back to make tents. Paul, Paul said, let me just make tents and make my own. Love him. You know, Paul said, keep your, if you think my mission in your life is about money, keep your money. I got other ways. I got streams of income. Paul said, I got a whole lot of ways to make money. I'm here to make mission. I'm here to carry out my assignment in your life. Y'all understand that? Why do we visit this? Because when you are in purpose, all manner of evil will be spoken against you. Just make sure you are not drowning in a sea of opinions. Are y'all convinced yet? Tell somebody, it ain't new. It's just your turn. <laughs> you are not special. In Acts chapter 9, verse 27... And we don't have time to go there, but we read that the church leaders, the leaders of the church, doubted Paul's conversion. They said, ain't no way his testimony is real. He's trying to set us up and find out who we are. They doubted his conversion. They doubted that God had 
transformed his life. They thought his assignment was a setup. He trying to spy out our liberty. Y'all understand that? Now, everybody that's ever been prophetic, one of the first things you ever got to deal with if you're truly prophetic is being called a witch. All right, come on. Come on. Let me, let me, I'm going I'm to shut this all down right here. I'm going to shut this down. No, I'm not talking about the prophecies that give you cars. You get a car. You get a car. Tell somebody that's that Oprah anointed on you. You, you, that Oprah. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. Not you. You get the bus. Yeah, you get a car. <laughs> no, when you really start getting accurate in the prophetic, God couldn't reveal that to you. So, so your gifts are attributed to other spirits. When you truly walk in the prophetic, as I've seen the prophetic in operation, people don't really understand how, how clearly God speaks to prophetic, truly prophetic people. You understand that? Prophetic people don't need gossip about you. No, 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 no. Now here's why. Because God trusts him. Come on. God trusts prophetic people with conversations you thought nobody heard. I didn't hear what I said. You understand that? God trusts prophetic people with, it, with an understanding of what's going on in the hearts of men that's keeping them from the spirit of Christ. So you got to deal with when you truly start flowing in the non-Oprah-like anointing. <laughs> then you got to deal with labels. You understand that? Then you got to deal with labels that others try to impose upon your life. Your job is to not, tell somebody, stop running after labels. Don't, don't waste your time trying to pull off those labels. Don't waste your time trying to pull off those labels, okay? Don't allow yourself to be drowned in the sea of opinions. It's a black hole. And I don't want anything, and I believe the Spirit of the Lord doesn't want anything to cause you to be moved away from the clarity that you find in the audience of one. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? You know, I'm going to close with this at 125. <laughs> Who needed to hear that? It's 125. Who needed to hear that? All right. I thank God that, I thank God that, you know, I got saved at 92. I was 22 years old. I got saved, and I was a part of one church for nine years before starting this ministry. But I thank God for all the foolishness I couldn't respond to. I thank God. I, I thank God for every lie was told on me. I thank God for all the animosity, all the jealousy. I thank God for the critical spirits. I thank God. You know why? Because I thank God that God was able to weed the care of those things out of my life before I stepped into my calling. Stand your feet if you would. I don't know who you are in this room. Thank you for joining us today. Visit us for one of two services on Sunday mornings, 8 o'clock and 10.30 a.m. There are so many ways to partner with us. If God is using this ministry to impact your life and you would like to reach others by sowing a seed, text the word GIVE to 754-210-8654. Visit www centerformanifestation.com to stay connected with us. Also, visit us on YouTube at Manifestations Worldwide. This is the season for the manifestation of the sons of God. Be blessed and manifest.